This is a presentation over the Bill of Rights. If you've been keeping up with class, you'll know that we are through the first four articles of the Constitution. Remember, there are seven articles in total. The reason why we haven't covered the fifth, sixth, and the seventh is that they go along better with when we get through more amendments. So we're going to come back to those articles later and now talk about the first ten amendments of the Constitution, also called the Bill of Rights. This is going to start getting into those debates. If you think back to the first day of school I had, you fill out those different stances and arguments that you had with each other and different debate styles. Now that, and the hope is, now that you understand more about yourself and where different people come from and why people think different ways, what political socialization is and what parties are, you can debate these issues intellectually and have an intellectual conversation and talk about you know, what really happens in society every day. But in order really to understand how government gets involved in this and really what rights you have, you have to understand these founding documents and what they actually state. The Bill of Rights was passed at the exact same time that the Constitution was passed. It wasn't passed years later. The first 10 amendments ca came into the Constitution as a result of the Anti-Federalists. The Anti-Federalists would not pass the Constitution unless the Federalists agreed to instantly add on the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments. These were meant to protect the common man. They were meant to make sure that the common man had all of the rights at their disposal. Again, the first 10, the Bill of Rights. The First Amendment, which is probably the most famous amendment, in fact, most people actually believe that the First Amendment is kind of the all of the Bill of Rights. They think each one of these is a separate amendment, but it's all in the first. It says you have freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, the freedom to peacefully assemble, and the freedom to petition, your basic rights. I mean, you can go out and protest as long as it's peaceful. You can go out and write to your newspaper and say crazy things on the radio. You can do whatever you want as long as you're not doing something that could harm someone else. That includes, like, lying about someone in, like, a public manner or uh, trying to def defame someone. Uh, if your religion involves sacrificing people, that wouldn't be good. You can't do anything that might hurt somebody else, but you do have basic freedoms. Most Americans consider this probably the most important part of the entire Constitution. It's what everybody refers to when they refer to America. The Second Amendment, which probably a lot of Americans consider the most important amendment to the United States, is the right to bear arms. The actual language of the Second Amendment states a well-regulated militia being necessary to the, free secu or the security of a free state the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. This is something that's debated on between Republicans and Democrats heavily, as well as libertarians, authoritarians, etc., every other political party. On what the Founding Fathers meant by the necessary to a security of a free state, the right of all people to keep and bear arms. Because these, the way that these were written is, is that they were written from the time period. Could Alexander Hamilton have recognized that eventually rocket launchers were going to exist? Because nowadays you can't go out and buy a rocket launcher, at least not legally. Uh, you can't buy a grenade and, you know, throw grenades out in front of your house. Uh, there are restrictions to the Second Amendment. You'll notice each one of these amendments has different debates over what the Founding Fathers meant. The Third Amendment is that you will not quarter soldiers. If you think back to the French and Indian War in history class, quartering soldiers means that a soldier can walk into your house and say, this is our house now, uh, feed us and give us shelter. That's illegal because the Founding Fathers did not like what the British were doing to them back in the day. The Fourth Amendment says there will be no unreasonable search and seizures without probable cause. Probable cause meaning that you obtain a warrant, or in some states, for example, uh, a police officer can pull you over if they smell like you have drugs in your car. Like if they, if they have probable cause to search, they can't. That's only in some states. It depends on what state that you're in. But probable cause is the, the idea that you have to get a warrant or something's fishy that is enough to determine that you can search them. This comes up a lot in debate. In fact, the activity that you're going to do today revolves around whether or not stop and frisk, which is a policy in New York, is considered unreasonable. Another interesting note about warrants is that you can only issue a warrant for a specific arrest. Let's say that this actually happened. Let's say that you were searching someone's house and you had a warrant for finding illegal drugs because you believe they have illegal drugs in there. And you search their house and you find a bunch of child pornography in there and you're a police officer. You cannot arrest that person for child pornography because you only have a warrant to search for drugs. What you can do is you can leave the house, file a separate warrant, go back in, 
and arrest them for it. But if for whatever reason that stuff disappears and you can't find it, they'll probably find a way to find it. But if they can't, that means that you cannot be arrested for it. You cannot be arrested for something that isn't directly in the warrant until another warrant is issued. The Fifth Amendment protects against self-incrimination and double jeopardy. This is usually referred to in uh, saying, I plead the fifth, meaning that you won't say anything to hurt your case in law. If someone arrests you, you can say, I want to speak to my lawyer. I plead the fifth. You know, I don't want to say anything. You can't self-incriminate yourself. Double, double jeopardy means that you can't be tried for the exact same crime twice. If someone says that you stole their, I don't know, you stole their computer and it's the jury says, no, he didn't steal your computer. And then they say, no, no, they actually didn't. They try to take you back to court for that. They can't just keep taking you, take you to court. That's double jeopardy. They can take you to court if they find DNA evidence that you stole their computer because that's enough new evidence that the judge can decide to bring you back. But if it's the exact same crime, they cannot. The Sixth Amendment is the right to a speedy public trial with an impartial jury. You can't have a trial go on for years and years and years just because the government says uh, that they don't want to hear you yet. Do trials take forever? Yes. But it's not because the government is intentionally trying to make it go a long period of time. This relates back to the monarchy. A lot of times French monarchs and British monarchs would keep people in prison for 20, 30 years, and then they didn't actually have anything against them to try them for. An impartial jury means that your jury cannot have any idea of anything about the case or have any opinions about anyone in the case, meaning racism, sexism, ageism, the list goes on. This was an issue with the Trayvon Martin case. If you remember, I believe it was, it was the beginning of last year or the, in the middle of 2013, uh, where a African-American teenager was shot by a white middle-aged white male. It was almost impossible to find a jury that was either not aware of the issue at hand or was not racist towards one party or the other. This has actually become an issue in recent years because a lot of people believe that in order to obtain an impartial jury, you actually have to get people that aren't very intelligent. Because if no one knows about these high-profile cases, a lot of people don't think they're worldly knowledgeable or have enough of an opinion to actually rule on a case such as murder. The Seventh Amendment is basically a trial by jury in general. It says that if it, the case exceeds $20, the right to a trial by jury shall be preserved and no fact tried by the jury shall be otherwise re-examined in any court of the United States. This means that if the jury says you were not convicted of murder, the judge cannot override them. Whatever the jury says goes. The Eighth Amendment says that there is no excessive bail. That means that if you rob a bread store, you can't get charged $500 million for bail. It has to fit the punishment of the crime. And that there's no cruel or unusual punishment. This is interpreted a lot in modern society about what cruel or unusual punishment is. A lot of people believe that torture is cruel and unusual punishment, and therefore the United States has gone in the past against their own constitution. A lot of people say that torture is not cruel and unusual. So this is very uh, interpreted. Uh, some people would argue that, uh, like even like the most minor things, people have argued that standardized testing is cruel and unusual punishment. There's a lot of weird things. Ninth Amendment says that other rights exist and cannot be violated. This is usually the one that everybody forgets exists in the Constitution. It says, basically, you cannot use the Constitution to prove that people do not have any other rights. As in the rights in the Constitution, like your freedom of religion, right to bear arms, are not the only rights that you have. You have other rights. Just because the Constitution doesn't include it does not mean that they don't exist. An example of this would be, all people would say you have a right to education. Because you have to get school... Uh, you have to go to school, that means that you should have the right to a decent education. The Tenth Amendment, and this is the big anti-federalist amendment because this is what the anti-federalists were all about, says that powers not given to the national level are given to the states. Any power that is not listed in the articles of the Constitution, those first seven articles, the all seven articles, if they are not in there and explicitly state that this is the national government, then it has to be given to the state. This is the reason why uh, gay marriage is a state issue and not a national issue, or marijuana legalization, because those powers were never given at the national level. Therefore, the states had to decide upon it individually. This was to make sure the national government did not keep adding more powers onto itself and to keep a lot of power with the states. 
So again, these are your first 10 amendments to the Constitution that were all added on at the exact same time, the Bill of Rights, added on directly after the Constitution was passed. And you'll find that each one of these has crazy amounts of court cases determining what exactly they all mean. If you look at, like, the Second Amendment, it's only about a sentence or two long. It's one sentence, but there's a bunch of commas. It's kind of like a run-on sentence. Trying to interpret that takes a lot, and we'll talk about that a lot more once we get to the judicial system. There are a few questions at the end of this presentation note section that you need to answer, and I'll explain what they mean. The first one is, does or should the Bill of Rights apply to non-citizens, meaning anyone in the United States? For example, if you are a tourist, do you have the right to peacefully assemble and protest, or can the government arrest you? Because, I mean, you're not technically a citizen of the United States, you don't have a Bill of Rights. The same goes with, let's say you have a green card, someone that's working in the United States illegally, but you aren't technically a citizen. Do you have the right to bear arms? Do you have the right to a trial by jury, or can we just try you however you want? This came up with many different terrorists that are being held at Guantanamo Bay. Whether or not they have the right to a trial by jury or in the regular court system. Does the Bill of Rights apply to them because they're technically on an American territory? The next question is asking you, what have you done to earn these rights? This relates back to unit number one. That citizenship and community stuff is not going away anytime soon. Did you do something in order to make sure that you obtained your Bill of Rights outside of being born here? Have you done anything? That feeds directly into the last question, which is, should there be a Bill of Responsibilities in addition to the Bill of Rights? And if so, what should that include? A Bill of Responsibilities, remember responsibilities are things that you have to do, mean that you would have to do things in order to obtain your rights. In China, a Bill of Responsibilities actually exists. In fact, many nations have a Bill of Responsibilities. An example of a responsibility in China is that you have the responsibility to take care of the environment, an environmentalism responsibility. That means that if you go out and litter or like intentionally blow up a rainforest, you no longer have your rights anymore. The same exact thing goes along with they have a right to a decent education, or a, right, a responsibility to a decent education. That means that if a decent education is not being provided to you, they can forcibly put you in a situation where it is. Many people believe that this can improve the quality of life of many Americans to have a Bill of Responsibilities, but others believe that this might be an overbearing of government power. The Founding Fathers didn't include a Bill of Responsibilities because they believed that the government could use this to just create more laws and control people more. But it does put you in a situation where you have to obey things in order to be a citizen, which is an interesting conundrum. The rest of this assignment has you looking at specifically the right to no unreasonable search or seizures. It deals with prison systems, and it deals with stop and frisk in New York. It deals also a little bit with the right to bear arms and no cruel and unusual punishment. Read through the document and establish a different opinion on each one of the issues. Make sure that you don't, that you don't only just understand that there are 10 different amendments, you also understand the debates that go into the amendments. I want you to understand the controversy. How is this How is this stuff applied? Why does it even matter that you're learning about it? And that's the point of each one of these. Every single amendment that we talk about will have something controversial that goes along with it.